This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Githu Yort. It's Thursday, April 30th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at our VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. The number of worldwide cases of COVID-19 on Thursday now tops 3.2 million with over 227,000 deaths, according to Johns Hopkins University. Deaths in the United States from coronavirus now exceed 60,000 and the outbreak will soon be deadlier than any flu since 1967, according to a Reuters report. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says in 1967, 100,000 Americans died from the flu. On average, during April, a Reuters tally shows 2,000 Americans died per day from COVID-19. Despite these grim numbers, the White House is not planning to extend federal coronavirus social distancing guidelines that expire Thursday, focusing instead on its efforts to work with states on plans to reopen the country. President Donald Trump says the federal guidelines that were first issued in mid-March are being phased out while his administration consults with governors on their plans. But many health officials continue to caution about moving too quickly towards Trump's desire to return to normal, saying that doing so risks new waves of coronavirus infections. Now to the continent, where South Africa confirmed an additional 354 COVID-19 infections on Wednesday, its most new reported cases in one day, a 73% increase from Tuesday, according to the health department. The nation's coronavirus cases now totals over 5,300. Meanwhile, Guinea-Bissau's health ministry says Prime Minister Nuno Gomez-Nabiam has tested positive for coronavirus along with three members of his cabinet. The West African nation has confirmed more than 70 cases and one death. Tunisia says it is set to ease its COVID-19 lockdown next week, reopening parts of the food and construction sectors while welcoming 50% of government workers back on the job. The use of militaries to enforce coronavirus quarantines is causing anxiety among some African citizens. VOA Salem Solomon takes a look at the risks and the benefits of deploying security forces during a pandemic. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has ordered the deployment of 73,000 soldiers to enforce a lockdown in the country's fight against the coronavirus. The move is unprecedented in the modern history of the country. Your mission is mission save lives. You are required to go out and save the lives of the 57 million South Africans who live within the borders of our country. Across Africa, security forces are being called upon to seal borders, enforce quarantines and maintain order. The measures are viewed with mixed emotions on a continent where, throughout history, military and police forces have been used to control the civilian population instead of protect them. There have already been instances of violence. On April 12, soldiers from the South African National Defense Force were accused of beating a man to death in Alexandra, north of Johannesburg. He was the ninth person killed in April by South African security forces, according to local reports. John Suko, a director at a security consultant firm based in Dubai, said most militaries on the African continent are not trained in maintaining public order. Infantry training that teaches soldiers to subdue an enemy or retake a position could have tragic consequences when applied to a civilian population. How many places are even sending guys into the into you know squatter camps or other you know, informal settlements around the continent, um, potentially with live rounds? It doesn't take much to set off a, a real disaster here. Siko said security forces need more training for missions that may require crowd control 
or other duties. I think it just speaks to the need that across the continent there's been a great deal of desire and uh, necess necessity for public order training to make sure that guys can respond in a, um, you know, a human rights respective manner uh, when this does happen. Dr. Cyrus Chapar agrees. He's a physician and director of the Prevent Epidemics team at a global public health organization with operations in Africa. Most militaries, when they get involved in disasters, do things like natural disasters. They're not so well trained on, say, infectious disease events because they can, these can actually affect the people responding as well. So it's important that that training is in place if the military is going to get involved to protect the military too, that they understand the risks of them getting involved in an infectious disease event, and that's all based in science. Siko said that foreign training often focuses on the military, but assistance is also needed to help the gendarmes and police forces most often called upon to interact with civilians. I think the next few weeks are going to be quite critical. And, and again, unfortunately, I do think it's a bit too late for uh, you know Western or donor responses to have much impact here. Uh, but again, it has to be strategic. Longer term, this is something that I think Washington, you know, the administration and others need to really be considering moving forward. Solemn Solomon, VOA News, Washington. With human trials already underway, Oxford University scientists say a COVID-19 vaccine could be available much sooner than originally projected. Global health experts speaking at Voice of America's virtual town hall discuss a clinical trial and the virus's long-term impact on how we live, travel, and work. Viewers Jesusa Menani has more. With hundreds of clinical trials underway in the global race to fight COVID-19, international health experts speaking at a VOA virtual town hall say they are feeling hopeful. We've never had this intermeshing of the advancement of science in conjunction with a brand new pandemic. And so I remain optimistic that something is going to be found out there. Scientists at Oxford University are touting a potential breakthrough, the group leaping ahead of most projected vaccine timelines by using a vaccination method like ones used in previous trials and proven to be harmless to humans. Human trials are now underway. It needs to be done very carefully so we don't introduce danger into our society. But this latest information from Oxford University uh, is, in fact, very encouraging. The hope still is that we will have something, right, in terms of potential therapy, drugs, uh, other things that are out there. For society, the changes we can expect in the future can range from going out to eat to international travel. You can uh, uh, make a decision uh, today and uh, purchase a ticket and to go somewhere. I think that's... Uh, probably cannot be like this anymore. So more planned schedules, uh, travel will be uh, the kind of futures and a lot of restrictions, regulations we have to follow uh, that enforced by the countries and who are uh, hosting a lot of visitors. Once we open up, the world will be definitely different from everyone because uh, we have to maintain the social distancing until we get vaccine in our hand. Because vaccine is the only cure for this disease. And till 60 to 70% of population is immunized uh, with this uh, vaccine, we are at risk, definitely. Also changing as a result of the pandemic, the way we work. We're gonna see a lot more people working remotely. We've been doing some surveys around this. A lot more people, about 80% of people are working from home now compared to something less than 10% on a regular basis. And interestingly, they all want to continue to do so. Oxford University scientists say their coronavirus vaccine could be available as early as September, as other labs are also ramping up their clinical trials. It's welcomed news for the millions around the world preparing for a new normal post-coronavirus. Jesus Samuel Ni, VOA News, Washington. U.S. President Donald Trump says he is not happy with China and has asked American intelligence agencies to investigate the origins of COVID-19 in Wuhan, China. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the world has every right to investigate. He says the U.S. is also worried about other labs across China that are conducting research on contagious pathogens with an unknown level of security. 
VOS diplomatic correspondent Cindy Sane reports. Asked about the investigation he has commissioned into China and the World Health Organization, President Donald Trump says he is not happy with Beijing's response when the coronavirus first broke out in Wuhan. This is all transpiring just as President Trump faces criticism by opponents of his own handling of the coronavirus crisis heading into a re-election campaign. Could have stopped that at the source. They didn't have to let airplanes fly out and loads of people come out. For their part, Chinese leaders say they want to be transparent and to partner with the United States to fight the deadly virus. But Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the Chinese Communist Party is still withholding information and denying one. access to its labs. Look, we still haven't gained access. The world hasn't gained access to the WIV, the Virology Institute there. We, we don't know precisely where this virus originated from. There are multiple labs that are continuing to conduct work, we think, continue on contagious pathogens inside of China today, and we don't know if they are operating at a level of security to prevent this from happening again. Chinese state media has blasted Pompeo by name along with Australia and other countries, for asking for an investigation into how the virus started and spread around the world, saying they are using the virus to unfairly stigmatize China. Who in the world wouldn't want an investigation of how this happened to the world? Asked about demands from some that China pay a price for the tens of thousands of coronavirus deaths and the global economic impact, Pompeo said there will be ample time to figure that out later. Cindy Sane, VOA News. Some U.S. states are easing widespread business closures implemented to slow the spread of the coronavirus pandemic, despite the number of cases continuing to rise. Over 55,000 people have died in America from the highly contagious respiratory illness, and more than one million have been infected. VOA's brand pardon reports that state governors are trying to balance the public health threat with the severe economic cost of the shutdown that has led to over 26 million Americans losing their jobs in the last month. Gyms, hair salons and dine-in restaurants are among the non-essential businesses that have reopened in the southern U.S. state of Georgia, the first state to take expansive steps to restart the local economy. Yet these businesses are required to maintain social distance guidelines, sanitize the premises, and screen employees for coronavirus symptoms such as fever. We are checking temperatures. We're making sure that clients fill out a questionnaire before we perform um, any type of services on them, making sure that the hands are washed. But Georgia's coronavirus infection rate is still rising, and public health experts warn that trying to ease the economic pain caused by the shutdown too early risks a more severe outbreak of the deadly virus. We are, as we open up the economy, potentially exposing immunologically naive people, meaning no antibody, no history of the virus, to the virus and ultimately may lead into a circumstance where we will lose lives. Protests have erupted across the country by Americans who want to get back to work, yet opinion polls show strong public support for restrictions on businesses and large gatherings to contain the outbreak until effective treatment or a vaccine is developed. President Donald Trump has left it to the states to decide when to restart economic activities. On Monday, he announced new guidelines to help businesses safely reopen and to increase testing capacity nationwide. Ensuring the health of our economy is vital to ensuring the health of our nation. These goals work in tandem. They work side by side. Some other states are also allowing certain businesses to reopen as widespread job losses and gaps in government unemployment assistance leave many without enough money to pay for food and rent. But it may be a slow process, say experts. We might have to do this gradually to see whether we can handle it or whether we suddenly get a new surge in cases of COVID. And it's going to be a delicate balancing act. In New York, which has been the epicenter of the U.S. outbreak, Governor Andrew Cuomo said the state is developing a phase plan to open based on guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control. First, states must see a sustained period of decreasing COVID-19 cases 
followed by increased testing and risk evaluation. Then we're going to leave two weeks between phases so we can monitor the effect of what we just did, right? Take an action, monitor. Even as some businesses begin to reopen, virus outbreaks have forced others to shut down. A surge of coronavirus infections in the meatpacking industry has closed some plants, disrupting the supply chain, which could lead to food shortages and higher prices. Brian Patton, VOA News, Washington. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, many businesses remain closed, but some are now offering online exhibits, entertainment, and fitness classes free of charge. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Africa 54. Friday is May 1st, the International Workers' Day, which is normally marked by demonstrations in cities around the world calling for better working conditions. But this year, the lockdown in many countries means the protesters will be forced to stay at home. As Henry Rito reports from London, there are new warnings that the coronavirus pandemic is wreaking havoc on the global economy. Hundreds lined up to receive emergency government aid in Brazil's Rio de Janeiro this week as the economic crisis destroys businesses and jobs. We don't even fear the coronavirus. That helps. The UN's International Labour Organization warns that half of all workers worldwide amounting to 1.5 billion people are in danger of having their livelihoods destroyed by the coronavirus pandemic. That stark prediction comes on the eve of International Workers' Day, May 1st. Sharon Burrow, General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, says this year we should be thankful for the workers who are putting their lives on the line. Those courageous workers in health, who uh, go to work every day along with others in care settings and risk their health and safety and that of their families to save lives. But there are others who make themselves available in, uh, in services, in transport, in our supermarkets. Burrow says many of those key workers feel insecure in their jobs. This uh, virus has exposed the, the fragility of our world. When you consider that 60% of the global workforce work informally, no rights, no minimum wages, no social protection, no rule of law to deal with grievance, that's simply an economic risk as well as a social devastation that has to be undone. May Day is usually marked by anti-capitalist protests. This year, with hundreds of countries in lockdown, demonstrations will likely be absent. Burrow says the focus should be on the world that will emerge after the pandemic. We must rebuild a more equal world that uh, guarantees democratic rights and freedoms, that allows for more equal development. Before that can happen, millions of people face a struggle to get through the coming economic crisis. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Optimism over a promising treatment for the coronavirus sent Asian markets surging Thursday. Japan's Nikkei index gained 422 points or 2.4 percent to close out the trading day at over 20,000. Australia's S&P was up 2.4 percent in late trading, while Shanghai's index had gained 1.3 percent. The indexes in Hong Kong and Seoul were closed for public holidays. 
The strong gains in Asia are a spillover from Wednesday's gains on Wall Street, sparked by news that coronavirus patients who were given an experimental drug called remdesivir in a federal trial recovered rapidly from the disease. The results were praised by Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, as very optimistic. More good news came from Britain, where researchers at Oxford University say a vaccine for coronavirus currently being tested on people could be widely available as early as September. Oil markets continued to recover with the price of West Texas Intermediate Crude, the U.S. benchmark, trading over $16 per barrel, a gain of 10.6%, while the international benchmark Brent crude was trading at nearly 6.2%. Billions of dollars worth of food is going to waste in Florida as local farmers let fruits and vegetables rot, unable to deliver them to restaurants that don't need as much as before the COVID-19 pandemic. Lilia Anisimova has the story narrated by Anna Rice. Best known for thousands of kilometers of beautiful beaches, the state of Florida, thanks to its climate and soil, grows some of the best fruit and vegetables in the U.S. More than 47,000 commercial farms that grow everything from citruses to beans and berries are in this state. Florida's great climate and soil is what made Italian-American family Di Mare move here from Boston in 1930s. As teenagers, brothers Dominic, Joseph and Tony used to sell fruit off a truck, but their business got successful and they opened a store, then another one. In 1945, they were able to buy their first commercial farm. I'm a grandson um, of one of the founders, my grandfather, uh, who I'm named after, Anthony, and his two brothers started the company, a 91-year-old com company. Uh, myself, my brothers and cousins are third generation in the family business. Uh, my father and his cousin, the two respective presidents uh, for the Florida and California operations, are still very actively involved. I think we still have uh, about uh, 10 uh, family members involved in, in the uh, family business. Today, the Demare Farms grow fruits and vegetables in several states. California, Texas, Arizona, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. The first ones to feel the effect of the coronavirus pandemic on the business were the Florida tomato farms. And unfortunately, because of the timing of the pandemic and with restaurants and the food service sector shutting down, 80% of our business is, is typically to the food service sector. Uh, the school systems, restaurants, uh, cruise ship industry, uh, the theme parks. Uh, so when the pandemic uh, started and those sectors closed down, um, we were kind of dead in the water, so to speak. There are thousands of farms like Demari's in Florida. They deal with the situation the best they can. Some give food away for the poor or those who lost their jobs. Others sell it for the fraction of the usual price. The U.S. government has allocated $349 billion to support small businesses and keep the workers' salaries, and nine and a half more billion to help cattle and agricultural farms that suffer as a result of the pandemic. With no definitive end of the lockdown in sight, Florida farmers hope the virus will weaken in the summer months. On top of the seasonal changes, social distancing could help bring the reproduction number below one. Uh, so synergistically, yes, but not, but not seasonal changes alone. And I think that's consistent with what we've seen from other uh, parts of the world where they are having ongoing transmission um, and uh, despite either being in the southern hemisphere like Australia or um, uh, and, and southern Africa that are outside the tropics or being in the tropics and having in some in many ways summer like weather. But no one can say that for certain and that's putting businesses like the Demaris at risk of disappearing. For Lilia Anisimova in Miami, Florida, Anna Rice, VOA News. As people continue to stay home to help contain the spread of the coronavirus, businesses, museums and other venues are trying to relieve some of their boredom by offering online exhibits, entertainment and fitness classes free of charge. As VOA's Julie Tabo reports, it appears to be a win-win situation. Got no 
everybody. This rare footage of jazz great Louis Armstrong is just a small sampling of a new online exhibit that takes you inside the musician's home without having to leave your own. It's being offered by the Armstrong House Museum in Queens and New York City Borough, which normally charges for entry into the historic landmark, but because of the COVID-19 lockdown, which has forced museums to close, the exhibit is being offered online instead, free of charge. Ah, Jane and... In Britain, London's National Theatre is screening some of its most popular productions online at no charge, as the theatre itself remains closed due to the pandemic. By launching this as a premier event, we wanted to get as close as we could to that feeling of people seeing a live event. Then we're hopeful that people can uh, link up with friends, family uh, around the country or even around the world all agree that they're going to watch it at the same time. Music fans can also enjoy popular shows online. British composer Andrew Lloyd Webber is streaming full-length performances of his musicals on a dedicated YouTube channel. And theatrical venues like the Metropolitan Opera recently streamed a live at-home gala performance with more than 40 leading artists performing from their homes all around the world. Front knee is over the front ankle, similar to lunge pose. Fitness companies are also reaching people in non-traditional ways. Athletic clothing retailer Lululemon is offering online yoga classes. Nike has free online workouts. And Planet Fitness is streaming live workouts on their Facebook page. We got 15 seconds left. Drive. Businesses are doing this for one simple reason, says clinical professor James Schrager. Promotion. When the whole economy slows down, let's take a museum, and no one is coming, it's a fabulous chance for you to get the word out there. And these clever businesses are realizing, at no cost to me, if I can get them to my site, I'm delighted to let them try what I have for sale later on. Hopefully, once this is all over, people will be going back into their theatres uh, and cinemas to get more of it. I think right now, that's what everybody needs, the chance to have a laugh, be entertained, and hopefully provoke some real conversation. To date, hundreds of thousands of people around the world have accessed these diversions, as they wait out the pandemic. As you're ready, arms come up. Julie Tabo, VOA News. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.